Hi there, thank you for joining me. This week we have a pretty serious topic about equine emergency evacuation preparedness. Uh, this is one of those topics that a lot of horse owners know that they should address, but it can seem pretty daunting and overwhelming. And I was going to originally film this outside, but there are so many helicopters and planes that are currently scooping up water out of the lake and dropping it on the surrounding mountains uh, that there was a lot of background noise. But I thought this was a really appropriate time to bring up the topic since many places around the world are experiencing not normal weather, or at least not in the history, you know, the last four or five years, a lot of changes in the weather patterns and things that we used to consider normal, uh, such as where I'm at. We never considered fire. We never thought about it. And now it's a yearly event. Um, and so this is something that I thought should be discussed more um, openly, more honestly, and I'm going to say more emotionally neutral. So I think one of the things that happens when people are uh, discussing or thinking about, I'll say, taking on, getting ready to uh, evacuate is they, one, are not clear on all the different aspects that can lead to, I'm going to say, the least possible uh, stressful scenario um, so that that way as events are happening, they can keep thinking through things and working through them as they arise one thing at a time versus just emotionally reacting and becoming overwhelmed and flustered and and then not keeping track of things and then just having total chaos. Uh, and so part of what helps with that clarity and decrease the amount of stress that can be associated if there has to be an evacuation um, is, is kind of separating out different aspects of the evacuation. So rather than just like trying to take on the whole concept of like everything we'd need to do, break it down into pieces. And again, you know, this is mostly going to focus on the horse part, but I am going to mention some, you know, human aspects too that can that can help um, minimize stress in a very stressful and undesirable scenario. One of the first things that I'm going to suggest is um, don't be hopeful and also do not, I'm going to say, overreact. So sometimes what I find is people will want to avoid the topic or thought or preparing for emergency evacuations, and then they go from sort of ignoring or in a state of denial that it could happen potentially in their area to this extreme you know, continuous thinking of the worst case scenario, everything that could possibly go wrong, why nothing will work, and it becomes debilitating. And then they still don't get ready for evacuation because now they're overwhelmed and flustered and just feeling like no matter what they do, it won't have a good outcome. So be aware if your emotions are kind of swinging in extremes when we think about this topic, when we think about your animals and evacuation and, you know, kind of put those emotions to the side for a moment as we think through things. Um, so in terms of, we're going to talk about the person first, and then we'll talk about the horses. In terms of us, I want you to think about that, like, if there is fire, basically all um, communication systems shut down, um, electricity usually shuts down. And so what would be left functioning? Because in this day and age, we rely on technology, on internet, um, on our cell phones for lots of different things. And often when that is taken away, there is a level of dysfunction, I'm going to say, uh, that many people have. So if you think this through, as far as, you know, if you're already in that place of assuming, okay, well, we got out, we're going, and I need to stop and get gas. Well, if electricity isn't there, the gas pumps aren't working, okay? If electricity isn't there, you can't run your credit card. Um, if the cell towers get damaged in the fire, your cell phone is not going to be working. So I want you to start to think of the evacuation that it is not a case of they, whoever they may be, whether it's firefighting crews or anybody else, will come and rescue you. And I also don't want you to think of it in terms of that once you reach a certain point, it'll all be fine. I want you to think about how much self-reliance could you possibly have in the packing, in being self-sufficient for a period of time, um, in the ability to load and unload everything, whether it's just one or two or just a few people, but not like relying on friends or neighbors to come and help you in the moment of panic to get things done. And 
If you start with that perspective, it will help you become more specific and less hopeful about how you're going to prepare, what you're going to prepare. Um, and, and then it will allow you to be clear as things evolve without having to rely on other people. So I'm going to say something, you know, there are many times that we rely on people or, or, or neighbors or friends or family offer with the best of intentions. But often in the moment of emergency, it is strangers who help strangers as opposed to whatever the, I'm going to say, plan or the original plan was. So if you can take away relying on everybody else and just seeing that if there are extra hands, then it's a bonus, but that in your preparedness, in your initial um, thinking through and practicing for evacuations, that the less people you have to rely on, the more self-sufficient you are, um, the faster you will be at being able to get things done and get out when you need to. Um, so in the sense of thinking about traveling, you know, one of the things that I always suggest is think about food and water for you. Think about having uh, currency on hand that does not require computer systems or electricity to run, which means cash. Most people don't carry cash at all. Most people don't have any cash on hand. But if there is an emergency and the computer systems are down, you can't run a credit card. You can't, you know, you rely on that as an option. So maybe an emergency fund that you can keep that also is easily accessible and in a fireproof safe. So that's one of the big ones. The second one is assuming that there will be fuel, meaning for your vehicle so that you can go whatever distance you need. Waiting to the last minute or when you can see smoke billowing out in a nearby area and thinking about fueling up is too late. And the other part is, depending on your vehicle or I'm assuming your tow vehicle, how far can you get? Because if one tank of fuel can only get you 40 miles, 60 miles, whatever it is, you know, whatever area you're going to. And then what? So maybe you initially evacuate, but let's say pumps are down for three days, four days, five days. Let's say, you know, whatever is happening, will you have enough fuel? So I always suggest to people to bring um, extra fuel with them so that they can be as self-sufficient for as long as possible. Uh, thinking about terms of food and water, not just for your animals, but for you. Like this, so much of the time we get fixated on the animals and we forget about us. So, you know, what are things that you can have stocked and ready to go in um, a car that does not require being kept cold, uh, that does not require a lot of, um, you know, kitchen appliances to open, cook, eat, so on, um, and that you have enough for you because one of the things that happens in emergencies is people quit eating and drinking and they have a lack of sleep and between that combination and then you add the stress they start making bad decisions so one of the easiest things you can do is keep eating and drinking throughout whatever may be happening uh, something else to think about is temporary bedding changes of clothes you know for at least a few days if not longer if possible um, have little basic things as far as like having a jackknife with you, um, you know, and some other basic, we'll say toolkit with you because you just never know what is going to come up, what is going to go wrong, what is going to break in that moment. Um, I can't uh, uh, emphasize enough how much bailing twine and duct tape can really save the day. Let me tell you, you may be cracking up, but everywhere I travel in the world, I take duct tape and bailing twine, and it's amazing what it can fix or temporarily uh, hold together until we can get to, you know, an ideal situation. So just something to keep in mind. Um, and fresh water is a big one. You know, if you if you just buying the little bottles of water and just have, you know, a, a case of 12 of those, that's nothing. You'll go through that in, in such a short amount of time um, because even just the basics, if you're exposed to the elements or, you know, there's all kinds of, you know, soot or ash or whatever in the air, just trying to wash your face. If you don't have enough clean water, you're going to go through your drinking water faster than you can believe. So just something to consider is... However much water you think you'll need, probably take three times that and you might be okay. Um, so, you know, some of these basics as far as bedding and blankets and layers and, you know, inflatable mattress, that sort of thing. I mean, you just don't know where you're going to end up and you don't know what the scenario is going to be. This is addressing the horse aspect. And, you know, one of the first things that usually comes up is when people say, well, my horse doesn't load well. Um, or if they say, well, my horse loads, but only if his buddy loads in the trailer or my horse loads, but he has to be in whatever position. Um, and this is one of those things that besides in general, your horse should be able to load in a trailer anywhere and at any time of day. So not just in a 
in a certain place or at a specific time, um, but under any circumstances. Um, this is something that should be addressed far before the emergency. Uh, there are options in the worst case scenario um, as far as having, you know, some mild sedatives on hand for the horse if you wind up being in a situation where you're by yourself and you can't get your horse loaded. But again, the first time to practice with any of this is not in the moment of emergency. Uh, so this is one of those things that, you know, even if in general you're thinking, oh, I want to go do the fun stuff with my horse and trail loading isn't on that list. Think of it out of just the basics for safety and for options for in the future with your horse that you want to be confident that at any time, anywhere, and if it's not just you handling the horse, that he will load in a reasonable um, manner. Now, I will say uh, that many times if you know as as they are herd animals that in the moment of chaos as all the other horses are getting in the trailer typically you know you'll have most horses want to you know get into the trailer but this brings up the next topic what is the current state of your trailer meaning do you have horse and human emergency supplies uh, stocked in it do you have water from home that your horse is currently used to drinking stocked in it do you have electrolytes do you have extra feed for your horse not just for a day or two but at least a week worth of feed or supplements or anything else that he might need especially if he's an older horse um, you know that you don't change his diet can be one of the the best things you can do to create a least re less stressful situation um, in a unwanted circumstance, we'll say. So the more we can keep the diet consistent um, where they're not changing hay and feed and all the rest of it, or at least have enough feed to transition maybe onto a different diet, depending on where you wind up or how long you have to be there. Um, and then think through the basics of like, okay, so if I was going to feed my horse, what do I have to feed him in? Uh, if I need to tie it to the trailer, not knowing where we're showing up, do I have temper? panels that I have packed or options for fencing even you know hot wire that solar you know um, that has a solar charger can work temporarily if you have to go somewhere if your horse again already understands what hot wire is and respects the fence line um, so I want you to think through like logistics of okay so if I need to tie the horse what if I need a spare lead rope what if I need a spare halter what if another horse comes upon us when we're somewhere do we have something spare in case something uh, something you know horse a show up unexpected think about it feeding time okay so if i need to open a bale do i have that handy you know knife or whatever it is that you need is it easier rather than bringing bale hay to have some bagged feed um, maybe with pelleted food which maybe you can take more of for a longer period of time but again we don't want to be suddenly changing drastic type of type of food so make sure that you've fed this before uh, what about water buckets what about how you're going to hang the water buckets um you know these are things where like the basic logistics people need to think through and then there's the aspect of the actual horse and I'm going to say labeling him putting you know some sort of indication that he's your horse if you know unfortunately he winds up getting turned loose getting you know um escaping from somewhere anything that could go wrong might go wrong so how would anybody know that your horse is your horse and you know I have a group of folks who are in Southern California who unfortunately have been battling the fires yearly and have had many escapes and they tend to put a tag around the horse's uh, fetlock area with phone numbers there are people who wind up um, painting on their phone number uh, but again if cell phones are down then it's very hard to get a hold of someone now at some point the towers will get back up and emergency systems will go into play but still there's a delay and a lack of knowing what's going on um, so just putting a tag on your horse's halter uh, doesn't always work because what happens if the horse gets separated from the halter then that doesn't do you any good um, and another aspect is is thinking about um, as far as you know how how does your horse is he okay with tying is he okay with hobbling is he okay with temporary corral setup how often has he left the property or is leaving somewhere new going to be like a totally mind-blowing experience another good reason to take your horse and change up his world um, the more frequent before the emergency uh, that you can you can even haul down to the local fairgrounds or to you know the the schooling facility or wherever just change up so that the horse starts to have a bigger world than maybe what he's currently used to many people 
people get stuck, especially if they keep their horses at home with never really leaving. And so by the time their horse leaves the property, it's like this complete mind blowing event and then add in an emergency scenario such as fire or anything else like that. Um, and in thinking about, you know, your emergency kit for your horse, um, you know, just in case some sort of minor injury happens to occur, what do you have in your vet kit? And there's a lot of lists online. Uh, I might post some links down below this video that, that gives you ideas about things that you can have for safety wise. Um, and then, you know, something else to think about is how will you logistically, let's say your horse loads, let's say you got everything loaded in your vehicle and your trailer, where will you go? Like how logistically will you get there and what are your options? Where I'm currently at, there's only basically two roads, north and south, east and west, and that's it. And, you know, something someone from the Oregon fires of last year was discussing was talking about how everybody was in line in their cars and trying to evacuate. And the fire came so close that at some point people started leaving their vehicles and running on foot. Well, to all the other vehicles that were behind them, they couldn't get around them and they had no idea of what was going on up ahead and why suddenly traffic wasn't, you know, the cars weren't moving and there was traffic and all these other things. So, you need to be thinking through not only what are multiple or various routes that you might be able to take, but then where are you going to go? Up here where I'm currently at in the summertime, you know, there's mountains, mountains, and more mountains, which means if you have a wildfire coming over the mountain range and it's out of control and the wind blo blows, unfortunately, the direction of that, that fire can change really quickly, but also where do you go in order to find safety and be near water um, and have a place temporarily for your horse and you to be okay? So again, this is one of those where like, if somewhere seems super obvious to you, like this would be a great place. There are probably many other people that are thinking of the same place. And if everybody's in a rush to get there, um, it, there can all be, be, you know, accidents and chaos and delays and all these other things going on. So, you know, don't just have backup plan like A and B, have like A, B, C, D and E, you know, have short term and long term. Um, when I say short term, I mean a week, uh, long term, meaning longer than a week. And, um, you know, think about what would you need if you were in those situations and what are your contacts for? What if there was, you know, some injury that happened to the horse and you were able to temporarily take care of it, but really the horse needed attending to? Where are the local vets, you know, uh, to wherever you're planning to evacuate to or what kind of help can you wind up getting um, or medicine or, you know, any of these sort of things where the more you can educate yourself in asking all of these questions that sometimes make people, you know, slightly uncomfortable because it's not warm and fuzzy things to think about. Um, but the more educated you are, the more you know your options, the more confident you are in times of crisis. And the the more you can practice bits and pieces. So I'm not saying like go in and practice the entire evacuation, but if each day you start to put things, you know, as far as what do I permanently keep in the horse trailer so that that's the horse, you know, emergency kit, the human emergency kit, the water is, is there, or if it's too long a time, change out the water so it's semi-fresh water, um, or the feed, or, you know, that sort of stuff. Like, you don't want to be waiting until you're getting notice of evacuation to then try and start packing because it's never going to happen. Um, and and the other thing is thinking about, you know, the small critters here on the farm. We have a whole variety of critters and no one gets left behind. Uh, and so if you need to have like cage setups for the cats, the chickens, the dogs, the goats, whatever you have. Um, is that currently set up in your trailer and what is the logistics of that? And do you have feed for those animals? And do you have a way to keep those animals contained, not just in the travel, but like if you actually get somewhere? Um, so, you know, if you start to break down the concept of the evacuation and without fixating on the idea of some stressful, unwanted natural disaster is beginning to happen and you're in a full blown panic. And just start to break it down into the human aspect, the horse aspect, uh, vehicle safety. That's another big one uh, that people don't really talk about is how many people are uncomfortable driving their vehicles. 
even if they have a horse trailer, that they still have a certain sense of stress if they have to back the trailer or if they're in tight places. Don't wait until the emergency to learn how to drive your horse trailer. There are plenty of horse farms that have fields, even if nowadays most of the supermarket parking lots are full. You know, that's where we used to go and practice in the old days. Um, but, you know, ask if you can go to a facility, go to a fairgrounds, go to anywhere where there's lots of space and go practice driving that trailer without your horse so that you can learn what is your, um, you know, turning radius on your tow vehicle. Make sure by yourself you know how to hook up and unhook that trailer. Have you had the safety? Have you had the a safety check done as far as like the tow brakes? You know, are they working? What's the quality and state of your tires? Do you have a spare tire? Um, you know, there there's all of these different things that you can be doing ahead of time, and the more that you address each of these in small pieces, the more confident you'll be under any situation. And the good news is, usually, the more you prepare and get everything ready the emergency never happens. But if you know in the back of your mind that you have options and you're clear on how and what you're going to do things in case of an emergency, it just, it takes away so much of the stress and the trauma. And, you know, I put the picture of my big trailer on here more of to get people's attentions to go, okay, wait, what is that? Um, but, you know, in thinking of the logistics of packing that, and if you think about it, when I evacuate, I take, you know, probably nine to 10 horses and plus the other critters. So, you know, that's a lot of livestock to one, be handling, but two, then to have to care for and then have to show up somewhere else. And people always say, well, don't you get overwhelmed? Don't you get, you know, and it's like, well, if you start to practice these things in small increments, little aspects of everything that you would need to for the whole evacuation, it becomes far less stressful. And the more that you can vocalize, you know, with friends or other horse people and have good ideas on things that maybe you haven't thought of, you know, you might say, hey, what if someone else had to take my vehicle? What if I wasn't there? And someone else had to take my tow vehicle and my horse trailer and they had to load the animals. Could they do it? And if you're prepared at that level to where you could talk someone else through being able or maybe you couldn't even talk them through. Maybe they just had to show up and do it. Things should be pretty obvious and clear and simplified. You know, um, sometimes I find people focus on like one aspect of saving certain things without like really thinking of the logistics like feed um, as far as what you would need out of practicality. You know, and the big thing to remember with all of these disasters, which, of course, is always far easier said, um, but mostly everything is replaceable, but saving the lives, you know, of your livestock, of your family members, you know, that, that is the crucial part that we really need to focus on. So, you know, if that is our priority, then the more we can prepare ourselves and the better we can be for, um, for future unexpected events. And unfortunately they're becoming a normal thing and we can no longer be hopeful or rely on someone else to take care of it for us, which many people have in the past. And, you know, there, there's horrific stories of I've I've been through fires uh, in the desert where, you know, the, the grooms luckily smelled the fire and just opened the stall doors. And it was really the only way to evacuate the horses. But unfortunately, those horses went running out into the highway and went running out through the saguaro cactus. And, you know, there was horrific things that happened and horses that get lo let loose in the mountains. And then, you know, because they're so domesticated, they, they don't have will say instinctive uh, abilities anymore to find the fee to find water and and you know there's a lot of unwanted scenarios that happen that people don't realize are happening unfortunately on a regular basis so just assuming that letting your horse loose is a good option that's kind of the last possible option if you cannot evacuate um, but again, being able to, how do you ever find that horse again? You know, and like I said earlier in, in having, you know, something, some form of identification, uh, on that horse so that anybody anywhere could recognize it, could see it, um, and, and can help reunite the horse with its owners. It's a big deal. So, you know, uh, leaving the emergency evacuation up to other people or leaving it up to your horse to figure out what he needs to do to save himself probably not the best strategy. So anyways, you might replay this video a few times. I'd love to hear thoughts, you know, down below. Again, this is just the tip of the iceberg, but to really get the conversation going and addressing a topic that unfortunately not enough people take the time to really think through the logistics of what all is going to be involved and are they ready? Um, and, you know, it, again, the more we can mentally prepare uh, and then physically pack and be loaded up and be ready, um, hopefully you never need it. But if you do, 
then you'll be really happy that you've already worked through all of these sort of questions and thoughts and options uh, that might arise in the future and be clear on what it is that you need to do to keep yourself and your horses safe. So thank you for joining me. I'd love to hear your comments down below and I will see you next week.